Coming up on Dr. Kiki's Science Hour, we're talking evolution and paleontology with Brian Sweetek. That's up next on Dr. Kiki's Science Hour. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Dr. Kiki's Science Hour is provided by CashFly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Dr. Kiki's Science Hour with Dr. Kiki, episode number 82, recorded on Thursday, February 3rd, 2011. No bones about it. This episode of Dr. Kiki's Science Hour is brought to you by MailRoute. Businesses of every size use MailRoute. One user to 50,000 users, it doesn't matter. Visit MailRoute.info and sign up with the email filtering service that Tom and Leo use. Welcome everyone to another episode of Dr. Kiki Science Hour. I am Dr. Kiki and we are in episode number 82 today. We are talking about old stuff, lots of old stuff. So are you ready? Ready to get down and dirty because we are really digging in today to paleontology and evolution. We're digging up bones and we're gonna talk about them. So questions of the past today are going to our very special guest, Brian Sweetek. He's a freelance science writer, blogger, and author of a book called Written in Stone, Evolution, the Fossil Record, and Our Place in Nature. According to his, uh, his website's biography, it says, in addition to the hundreds of essays that he's written, and really, he is that prolific, I've looked, there are, hun there are hundreds of essays there, for the blogs Laylaps and Dinosaur Tracking, he has also contributed pieces to The Times of London, Smithsonian, Wired Science, The Guardian, academic journals, and a variety of other publications. He also enjoys talking about evolution, the history of science, blogging, science, and communication. So what, what, what better guest today than to, than to get Brian in and have him talk with us about paleontology and i have some very specific questions that i'm going to ask him today brian welcome thank you so much for joining me thank you i'm glad to be here yeah you're welcome um i've actually been we were talking before the show fall before the show started about you know how you follow people online for a long time and don't actually ever meet them in person or get to talk with them and you've been on my twitter list for ages so i just want to let you know that i've been following you <laughs> Well, I've been following you back, so it's good <laughs> good to know that it's been going both ways, I guess. A little mutual Twitter stalking. That's okay. It's all right. It's what it's for, yeah. <laughs> exactly. So tell tell everybody a little bit about you. Um, you're obviously passionate about evolution, paleontology, bones, ancient humans, you know, dinosaurs, how we how how history occurred to get us to where we are today where did this passion come from uh i've i don't exactly know where it came from i went through a couple different phases as a kid there was a truck phase an elephant phase and then a dinosaur phase and it kind of stuck at the dinosaur phase and uh, <laughs> i went to marine biology for a little while but i was interested in sharks so really things with big teeth always sort of fascinated me and uh i think i while I was in college, I took a course on communicating ocean science, and I was going to teach a lesson about a uh, whale evolution to a local elementary school class. And the principal didn't want me to do that because he didn't want any uh, phone calls from angry parents saying that you know I was telling um, you know the kids that there wasn't any God or that you know God didn't create whales or something like that. And well, uh, I'd never run into creationism before. So as a result, I started reading about that, and I realized that I didn't really know anything about evolution. So I started studying um, the science a little bit more in depth. And from that point on, uh, it, I was just really, uh, really enthralled by paleontology. There are all these stories. There's the story of the animal themselves, the stories of uh, the people who went and, and found them and collected them. Um, just, you know, every single bone tells a story. And I just think that's absolutely fascinating. You can pick almost any, you know, scrap of bone. You can, you know, talk about a you know, whole skeleton or you can talk about just, you know, a little finger bone or a tailbone. And 
derive a whole story from that or multiple stories from it, depending on, you know, which way you're looking at it. And uh, I just think that's really wonderful. And that's what fueled my writing is I really wanted to share this with with, with people. Um, I felt that these stories weren't really getting told um, or making it out to the public. Uh, I'd read about them in uh, scientific journals and hear about them at uh, conferences, but I wouldn't really see them in um, news reports. Or if I did see them, I didn't really think they were being reported very well. So I figured I might as well take that job uh, myself and just start writing about paleontology and evolution. Do you think that's changed at all? Do you think that uh, the coverage of, uh, I mean, paleontology specifically, but, um, but science in general, uh, has that changed since you started writing? Um, I think there has been some change and I think it's been for the better. I've seen um, a lot of crossover and I can speak about this because it's happened to me between bloggers and mainstream publications. There are a lot of people who started off blogging and now will get picked up in uh, newspapers. I mean, one of the first pieces I wrote was about a primate fossil that was really controversial, the famous Darwinius or uh, Ida fossil that was announced in 2009 and everybody said it was yeah. the missing link. And I read the paper and it really didn't, um, you know, the evidence didn't support that claim. And I started blogging about it. And as a result of that, I got invited onto radio shows and I wrote for the Times of London and that it sort of snowballed from there. Um, and I think that's one of been, been one of the really interesting things about science communication lately is that you're getting this sort of cross-pollination between people who used to be just online and people who used to be just in the traditional media. Uh, we're sort of realizing that we're all in this together and we could all do a lot better in terms of science communication. So, um, yeah, I think that's been one of the positives. But then again, there's, there's always, um, you know, publications or um, people who just churn out uh, press releases over and over again. During the past week, there's been five or six new dinosaur discoveries. And most of the mainstream coverage I've seen of that hasn't really been accurate. There's a, a horned dinosaur that they found in uh, New Mexico. And, you know, it's, it's an interesting fossil, probably isn't actually a new species. It's probably just a really big version of a species that we already know about. But, uh, you know, as a hook, all these publications are using the headline, you know, ancestor of Triceratops found. Well, there's no indication that it was. There's nothing in the paper that says that it was. There's something in the press release where the scientist writing the, the paper said that it was. But it seems like, you know, everybody just the press release for granted, didn't read the paper, didn't really look for the context of of these discoveries. And I think that's still a problem is that you have a lot of people who aren't necessarily familiar with the field writing about it. So when something comes out, they just, you know, run with it and don't say, hey, this seems a little fishy, you know, maybe I should check up on it. And that's an area I think that still needs a, a lot of work. Yeah, well, I, the, paleontology is something, I mean, how many people know exactly what the limits to the dinosaur group are? You know, how many people just look at a story and go, oh, it's a fossilized bone or it's something fossilized dinosaur, you know, yeah. and just and just generalize without actually taking the time to consider exactly where it fits into uh, evolutionary history, into the uh, the tree of life and um, and what exactly uh, is being told to them by the scientists or the press release that they're probably yeah. working off of. I went on a little Twitter rant uh, during the past week, I guess, about this sort of thing, because it seems almost, when it comes to dinosaurs, every single discovery is uh, related back to Tyrannosaurus rex. It could be, yeah. you know, like new herbivorous dinosaur, T-Rex could have eaten 10 of them for breakfast, or, you know, giant predatory dinosaur more fearsome than T-Rex, or this thing, you know, was bigger than a T-Rex or smaller than a T-Rex or lived alongside T-Rex. It's, you know, I, I love Tyrannosaurus rex as much as anybody else, but there were other dinosaurs you know there are thousands of species now that, that that we know of so you know i understand that's the common hook but it almost seems just like a bit lazy it's just i don't know just throw something about t-rex in the title and people will will read it um so i i, I wish that uh more reporters would stick their neck out a little bit and get a little more original with their uh descriptions but i'm not sure how soon that's going to happen yeah um speaking of stories that come out in the news and and picking up um picking up on different things. I actually, one of the reasons I contacted you is you were referenced in an article um, by, um, I'm totally going to blank on it, uh, the NPR, NPR writer, Robert, Robert Pro Prolwich. Yes, and in the article about asking the question whether or not killer storks used to eat human babies. And I was wondering if you could comment on that at all. Yeah, sure. Um, 
Well, th this took place on the island of uh, Flores. So in the not too distant past, there lived uh, a group of um, archaic humans, the hobbits, these, you know, pygmy, or, or rather I should say dwarfed people, only about three feet high as, as adults, probably a, you know, unique species of human that became um, dwarfed on this island. We see it amongst other species on this island. There's a species of elephant there that became dwarfed, and oddly enough, uh, some of the small species became giant. So you had small humans, small elephants, uh, giant rats and they recently discovered a stork now you know the stork was a giant in absolute terms it was about six feet high but compared to uh, modern day storks it wasn't really any larger than like a living marabou stork that lives in africa or some of the storks that live uh, in india but when you're a three foot high human it's got to be pretty scary to see a bird twice as large as you were <laughs> and it looks like the stork is actually pretty unique in that it became stuck on the island it probably lost its ability to fly and they figured this out because the scientists looked at the lower leg bones and the leg bones were very thick and very mineralized so it looks like it was sort of specialized for running on on the ground after some of these big rats rather than you know flying through the air so when uh there was a volcanic eruption on the island that probably wiped out the elephants and the humans or probably took the stork with it so anyway you, you have you know tiny humans you have a giant stork and even though this new study itself said nothing at all about what the stork probably ate or whether it's interactions with people a lot of uh, newspapers like the daily mail and, and, and the telegraph um you know came up with headlines like you know giant storks you know ate babies instead of uh delivering them or you know giant stork was the terror of of early humans and yeah. it's one of these things that's it's within the realm of of possibility um you know this was a six foot stork it certainly if it happened across you know a, a an infant uh hobbit or a, a juvenile um, you know, one of these humans, it, it could have um, killed and eaten it, but there's no definite, um, no definite evidence of that. And the scientist said, if you look at all these reports under the headline, it'll say, but we talked to the scientist and the scientist said that there was no actual evidence of it. So I used it as a sort of way to get at the idea of monsters, you know, because here you have this it reminded me a lot of, of those B-movies from the 1950s, the sort of Earth versus the Spider sort of thing, or Them, or um, Empire of the Ants, or The Incredible Shrinking Man, where you <laughs> have a sort of role re reversal where, you know, be, by becoming tiny, you know, or, or, or insects or, you know, scary things becoming larger, they become monstrous. Um, and how the, the, the uh, identity of the stork as like a human-killing, rapacious predator is basically invented because, you know, you, if you saw a stork that big, it would be pretty scary. And it's sort of like evidence be damned. That's one scary stork. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can, I can understand where, the, uh, where the, the kind of fun, the sensationalist angle came from. But, you know, the fact that they never found any little hobbit baby skulls near the dead stork nest, you know, the fossilized stork remains, um, you know, they're just putting things together and it, you know, it's yeah. like, it's a, it, it's not a, it, it's, it's a made up story. Yeah, yeah, there was something similar. Um, you know, it wasn't picked up in the same way, but I wrote about it, I think, about a week after because I was on a tear about this sort of reporting where you had two new species of saber-toothed cats found in um, yeah. Africa dating to about 7 million years ago. And around that time, there was this ape, maybe closely related to our earliest um, ancestors, maybe sort of a collateral cousin. But either way, you have this, you know, ape, uh, human-like creature living along possibly three species of saber-toothed cat at once. And this publication had come out, um, I think in September of last year, but all of a sudden it was, you know, making headlines like the BBC and all over the place. And the only reason it did is because they said these saber-toothed cats probably ate these, you know, early human-like creatures that, you know, that it wasn't um, about the discovery itself. It wasn't about the cats themselves. It was more about, you know, the threat that they would have posed. So, I, and I read the papers and I went back to it and Chances are you didn't have three species living alongside three species of saber-toothed cat living alongside one another, um, sort of going after this human at the same time. There's a, a concept in paleontology called time averaging, where in a given deposit, um, you have to figure out how long did that take to accumulate. You know, you might have one fossil layer, but that may have taken you know tens, hundreds, thousands, maybe a million or two years to accumulate. So within a span of about 300,000 years, we know we had these three cat species, but we're not sure whether they all lived alongside one another or not. And you have to remember that, mm. you know, this this ape-like creature called uh, Sahelanthropus 
it um, was pretty small. It was about the size of a gibbon. And saber-toothed cats were specialists on um, very large prey. They basically had to eat large things because of the way that their teeth were shaped. So they could, you know, sort of rip out the throats of things like elephants or hippos. They were really specialized on feeding on uh, animals with a lot of soft tissue. So for them, one of these early, you know, human ape type things um, wouldn't have been a very good meal. It would kind of been like getting fish and have it be all bone. You know, it, it wouldn't have been that satisfying. So I can't really see these saber-toothed cats sort of, you know, hunting down and killing, um, you know, this ape-like creature on, on a regular basis. But that's what makes headlines. Yeah, it kind of, it sounds kind of like, you know, it's as opposed to like a nice trout or a, a piece of salmon or something, you're getting mm. an anchovy. Yeah, <laughs> pretty much, yeah. <laughs> Tasty. Yeah, the... Um, I, I I thought that I saw I saw your blog post on the the saber tooth cats as well, and I just I I love the the storytelling and all of it, where you know people really want to come up with some with something. You know, they want they want to see oh ancient ancient um, ape species, ancient you know human ancestor was terrorized by some monster. You know, it just makes such mm-hmm. a good story, but. Yeah. Um, but like you said, when you start putting it together, I mean, biologically, ecologically, it doesn't really make sense for the mm-hmm. saber tooth cats. I mean, maybe for the storks, it would have made perfect sense. Maybe they were big enough. I think marabou storks do actually, um, are they are meat eaters. They will go after other birds' nests. Um, you know, small animals are perfect prey. Um, so, you know, maybe a little tiny human would have been a yeah. bite-sized snack for one of those big birds if they could get mm-hmm you know, fly in and get away without being um, injured by these little humans who probably had uh, spears or something to be able to protect yeah, themselves tools, with. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. The saber-toothed cats, however, you know, very a predator species. They probably have large uh, habitats, large uh, uh large territories that they lived in they probably you know th- considering that there would be three at the same time i think you're to- you know all the evidence seems to point away from right and what what kills me i guess is that we have good examples of uh, cases of early humans being preyed upon by by predators they named a, a crocodile uh, they called it um crocodilus anthropophagus basically the human eating crocodile because some of the early homo habilis fossils that they got from Olduvai Gorge, that famous locality uh, in Africa, they had these puncture marks in the foot bones from these crocodiles found in the same Mm. deposits. So we know that these crocodiles are probably at least scavenging, if not actively preying upon these people. Same thing at um, the famous Dragon Bone Hill site in China, where you have, uh, you know, some of the first Homo erectus fossils that were ever found that for a while they thought that these early humans were uh, cannibals, that they were, you know, basically attacking each other because all they all they ever found were the uh, skull cap and a few other bits and pieces. But later Mm -hmm. analysis showed that this was a giant hyena den. And basically the giant hyenas had crunched through the entire skeletons and they had a particular way of basically opening up the skulls to get at the brains of these humans. But that's a story that I I had never heard about before, that, you know, you have these giant hyenas that drag, you know, these um, Homo erectus back to their caves, you know, basically go through the entire skeleton and have their own technique for, you know, opening up the skull to get at the brain. Um, you know, you don't need to make things up when you have stories as good as that. And that's part <laughs> of the reason why, why I blog is to bring some of those stories out. <laughs> no, I think you're absolutely right there. I mean, I'm just sitting here thinking about thinking about giant hyenas attacking humans and sucking their brains out. That's, Yeah. Yeah, I, I'd wet the bed. <laughs> you know, thinking, hyenas are coming to get me. Oh my gosh. Um, in in terms of like, I think there is another blog post you had about a different um, hominid species. Um, I think uh, regarding the uh, the location where Lucy was found and a number of other ske- uh, hominid skeletons. Um, and the question of what caused their death. Right. Yeah, this is the, yeah. the uh, first family locality. Um, and it's, it's right next to where Lucy was found. It's about the same same age as well. And for a while, the, the idea was that a flood sort of swept in and killed this entire group um, all at once. There's anywhere from like seven to maybe 13 or more um, individuals of this Australopithecus afarensis family found together. Um, no complete skeletons, all just bits and pieces. Um 
and it seemed that this was like a high energy water channel. So I, I, I read a, a book, um, I forget what it was called, but they, they sort of reconstructed the scene where this family of Australopithecus falls asleep at night and they don't realize what ha what's happening and they wake up to this, you know, uh, rushing torrent of water that sweeps them through and kills them and buries them um, after the fact. But um, one of my favorite paleontologists, uh, she works at the Smithsonian right now, uh, Anna K. Berensmeyer, she is a specialist in basically what happens to bodies after death. The science is called taphonomy. And she mm. went back to the site and she looked at it. And this wasn't a high energy water channel. The, all the bones are in this sort of little dip in the landscape that was maybe like a foot deep. Or so, so it sort of looks like this dried out riverbed that animals used to walk from one location to another, like as they're going through this dry habitat. And the bones themselves were actually deposited when the sort of more gentle flow of water washed them into this little dip in the landscape. So they probably actually died somewhere out on, on this uh, river channel and then uh, they decomposed and then their bones were later washed into place. Now what killed them in the first place is, is really the question. I mean, it, um, some people have suggested food poisoning, but there's no way to really test that. Some people have suggested predation. Um, if that's the case, then we're, we're expecting to find tooth marks on the bones or some other direct signs that these these uh, individuals were killed. Some people still think, maybe, well, maybe there's an earlier flood and then they died and then they got washed in to this little dip in the landscape. So it's still something of a mystery. But um, that original story of sort of this entire family uh, being caught by surprise and um, you know killed all at once doesn't really work anymore. It's sort of, you know, paleo CSI. And uh, it's a pretty common thing for, for paleontologists to do this. Like, you know, you always think that uh, paleontologists are going after the bones themselves, and, and that's it's all about just, you know, sort of smash and grab, get the bones, take them out, take them back to the museum, put them together, but that's it. And that's it, but that's not really the case. You know, there's usually um, a lot of detailed field work that goes into recording, you know, the orientation of the bones, the sort of geologic setting, because all that can give you an idea of how this animal died, you know, what happened to it. After death, I'm working on a uh, fossil crocodile right now at the New Jersey State Museum. I'm a research associate there. It's a, a mm. crocodile from um, 65 million years ago. It was found in the southern part of the state, sort of, you know, when there are real monsters on the Jersey Shore, not just Snooky. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that this, was funny. Thing, thank you. <laughs> and. Um, so this thing sort of curled up when it died. There's a sort of common death posture that you see for um, crocodiles. And as I, it, so we're, it kind of makes a C shape. And as I was cleaning up the tail portion of it, um, I found a bunch of shark teeth. So what that tells me is that when this thing died, it was still exposed for a little bit while a little while and sharks came along and uh, nibbled on it. So that's not quite as spectacular as the hominin site that we were just talking about, but um, that's, that's a standard part of paleontology is trying to figure out what killed these animals, what happened to them after death, how long did they remain exposed on the surface. And there's a lot of information that we're still finding that's in collections. Um, a couple months ago, there was a paper about um, how T-Rex scavenged its own kind. It was a, a, a cannibal. Yeah. They found a bunch of Tyrannosaurus rex toe bones with uh, tooth marks on it that could only have been made by another T-Rex. So it seems that these scavenging individuals were really uh, desperate for food because the only way that you're going to leave tooth marks on a skeleton is if most of the flesh has already been removed. So just one little bone with a tooth mark on it can tell you a lot about um, the ecology and interactions of the animals, you know, millions and millions of years ago. Yeah, and I'm just thinking about the, 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 the CSI aspect to all of mm -hmm. this and how you how you piece everything together. And that's something that's always amazed me um, when I hear about you know, the finding of a, you know, a piece of a jawbone in a drawer in a museum, and suddenly there's a story about, you know, this uh, relative of a pterodactyl, and this is uh, how big it was, and this is what kind of food it ate, and this is what kind of environment it lived in, and suddenly there's an entire history because of a, a piece of a jawbone. And I've yeah. never, it, it's just so hard from an outsider's perspective, you know, not being in paleontology. Mm. Um, you know, I, coming from, from a biology background, ecology, um, you know, I can see how the pieces, how assumptions can be made. But at the same time, it's, um, you know, it's, I, 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 I don't understand how, how inference is able to get you so yeah. far. Well, a, a lot of it is... Uh context um a lot of you have to have an almost encyclopedic 
knowledge of um, organisms and, you know, what their anatomy is, the sort of environments that they lived in. You know, it takes comparative anatomy plus geology plus, you know, um, you know biology and ecology to put all this stuff together. Um, there's... I think the, the, the idea of the paleontologist is sort of like a magician that's able to look at one bone and reconstruct the whole animal it comes from a Victorian anatomist, anatomist named uh, Richard Owen. He was basically the chief um, anatomist in England uh, during most of the 19th century. And uh, he got a bone from uh, Amoa, these giant birds that lived in uh, New Zealand. And he only had the one bone, but he came up um, with a whole reconstruction, sort of like an ostrich-like animal. And when they found the whole skeleton, it turned out that he was correct. Now, he's already, so, already sort of tipped off that this was probably a bird, but it's still pretty amazing that he was able to do that whole thing. Cases like that are relatively rare that somebody lucks out in that way or is able to you know come up with a hypothesis that's um, proven correct to that degree uh, many times you know you have a fragment of a bone and you say okay what are the unique characteristics of of this bone that you know allows me to figure out what you know what sort of creature it was, what it was related to. You look at the geological context, the, you know, was this a river environment? Was this a, a, a lake shore? Was this an ocean? Was this a swamp? Uh, what sort of other things were buried alongside it? So you have to pull all these things together to come up with these reconstructions. And oftentimes you'll see little papers show up in um, the paleontology literature. It's like, you know, the tip of a femur or the tip of a toe bone that we can tell sort of what sort of dinosaur it was or what sort of mammal it was or what sort of, you know, organism it was. But, um, you know, not say much more than that until more of it is, is, is found, um, right. you know, but some of them, you know, if, if you have already have a strong knowledge about a particular group of animals and you fa find, um, you know, a piece of it, you can start to make some pretty good inferences. Like, you know, we know so much, you know, to go back to tyrannosaurs, I'm probably, you know, breaking my own rule based upon what I said earlier. <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, so let's say, you know, we know so much about them. So let's say, you know, you're, you're, you're out in the field one day, you know, a site where tyrannosaurs have never been found before, and you find, um, you know, a, a single tooth that's really robust and has this uh, D shape to it and these fine serrations um, that's consistent with, you know, what you see in the mouths of tyrannosaurs. So now you're able, and you do comparisons based upon that, you know, make make sure, but based upon that single tooth, you can say, okay, tyrannosaurs were at this site. You might not be able to say exactly what it looked like or exactly what it was eating or, or doing, but it's the beginnings of putting that together. Um, so, but what, but when you don't see all the uh, sort of intermediate steps, it looks almost magical to be able to take one scrap of bone or one tooth and come up with an entire organism, and even ecosystem. Yeah, absolutely. It definitely is. Um, and, but at the same time, there are still controversies that do come up. So like you mentioned, um, Ida, the discovery, yes. uh, you know, the it was this huge story about, oh, this, uh, this lost ancestor, missing link, you know, everybody was, you know, all over Ida. It was a huge, it was, uh, it was, it was a, a press a media circus at the time. Um, and then the other, the other example that comes to mind are the Homo floresiensis, floresiensis, <laughs> the yeah. hobbits, um, where scientists are still, you know, have been debating, are they a subspecies? Are they just a dwarfed human uh, population? You know, what's the story and what, what pieces of evidence? So, you know, all the evidence, it, even though stuff gets published, sometimes more publications need to happen to really work out all the science, right? Exactly, yeah. And and that's one of the um, difficulties that we have in terms of communicating science, because usually there'll, there'll be a um, science or a nature paper, and it'll make a relatively big splash, and you'll get a lot of attention. But then the subsequent papers and the commentaries that come after that, you know, even sometimes in the same journal, you'll, you know, months later, you'll see a rebuttal to a paper that uh, appeared in Science or Nature, but those don't get covered as much. Um, so it, it, it is really difficult when you have something that is um, really controversial, whether, you know, it turns out being right or wrong is, is another matter, but you have this, you know, controversial piece of evidence or a bit, bit of science, and, you know, the whole story might not come out until months later. So scientists are talking about this, they're coming out with publications, they're going to conferences and, and, and debating this, but that's all sort of hidden from public 
view. It's not getting um, covered. You know, that you, you mentioned um, Ida, which was one of the you know controversies that I was more directly involved with, and uh, I wrote a, a paper about you know how blogs played into this whole controversy and trying to get some of this information um, out. But you know, it's really hard to compete with you know a major media, you know, major press conference at the Museum of Natural History with the Mayor of New York. You know, two documentaries, yeah, yeah. a book, a dedicated website, and within a couple of months. Um, I think that that paper came out in in May, and then in October there was a paper that you know confirmed what a lot of people were saying that Darwinius really wasn't um, you know one of our direct ancestors. It's more closely related to uh, lemurs. It's an you know extinct lemur cousin that's pretty far removed from us, and that got some pickup, but nowhere near as much attention. Um, and and that's one of the, one of the problems. It's you know it, it's easy for things to sort of slide back. From from view, and then you know maybe once a year, every once in a while, you know there'll be something new that'll kick up the controversy again, and they'll make headlines. But um, there's a lot of science that goes on there. A lot of people just miss out on because it's going on in the journals and it's going on at the conferences. And uh, that's I think one of the um, valuable reasons to keep up with uh, science blogs and look to science blogs as a news source because often you have people who are either amateur enthusiasts or experts themselves or scientists or people working on on this sort of stuff, and they keep keep up on it um, and, and, and they, you know, aren't obliged to just, um, you know, regurgitate press releases or whatever. They'll usually tell you, you know, I think this is wrong and this is why, you know, whether they're right or wrong, again, that you have to look at the evidence yourself. But um, I think that's one of the valuable parts of having science blogs be part of the modern sort of um, science communication ecosystem is that it allows people who do have expert knowledge to directly engage with, uh, with the public. Yeah, and I, I think it, additionally, it also really teaches people about science as a process as opposed to mm -hmm. science as discrete facts and discrete mm -hmm. bits of information. So as instead of, you know, reading one story and hearing one thing in the news about, oh, human ancestor, no, it's a lemur, um, you know, that this one story that you hear, how about actually following the story over a long period of time? And every time there's a new piece of information, somebody publishes a new paper, suddenly, you know, somebody's bringing it up and talking about it in a blog or on a podcast. Yeah. And you and you get a real wealth of information that actually takes you much deeper into what's going on scientifically. Yeah, yeah, I think so. And, um, you know, it, it, like you said, it helps remind um, people, or it helps remind me that you know, science is is a process. You know, just because someone publishes a paper, doesn't mean that's necessarily true. You know, but when I first started getting into blogging, or, or I first started uh, getting interested in science and reading papers again, I was still under you know the impression that okay, well, if, you know, this makes it through the publication process, then I can pretty much take this. At, Face value, you know, this is you know an accurate piece right. of information. Obviously, now now that I've you know sort of uh, been digging through a little bit more, I know that that isn't true. But I think that's the impression that a lot of people have because all they see is the end results. They don't see the the, the debates, the discussions, or you know how we know how we've come to know what we know. They just see, okay, this is the finding. Here you go, accept it. And um, I I don't like that way of um, communicating science to to the public. Yeah. You know, I feel it's kind of cheating them in a way. Because oftentimes when I sit down with people and uh, watch documentaries, like my my in laws uh, usually come down from Newfoundland, Canada, and uh, stay with us, you know, twice a year. And I usually have some kind of new um, screen or DVD of a dinosaur documentary or something that that's on, awesome. and I usually watch it with them. And you know, the documentary will make some claim like, you know, uh, this pterosaur could see, you know, the carcass of a dead dinosaur from 10 miles away. And they'll turn to me and say, well, how do we know that? And I say, well, either we don't know or this is how we know. But that's generally left out. You know, the people are just presented with, you know, here's the end result. Here's what we know. And how we've come to that understanding is never really explained. And, yeah. you know, what bothers me about that is a lot of people want to know. I, th I think um, the public is often sold a little bit short. You know, we assume that they can't handle, um, you know, the technical process or technical ideas. I mean, you still have to watch, you know, jargon and, and, and uh, make it as accessible as possible. But I think people really like it when, when you say to them, okay, here's the finding, here's how we came to it, because it's a story and that makes it easier yeah. to, to understand. Yeah. Give them all the pieces for sure. Um, I need to take a quick break to thank our sponsor this hour. Um, businesses of every size, 
use MailRoute. MailRoute is a secure hosted service that filters virus and spam for companies of any size. Whether you're a single user or a company with tens of thousands of employees, MailRoute can eliminate viruses and spam, reduce the load on your email server, lower your costs, and make your email usable again. Typical mail route customers see a 95% reduction in their inbound email volu volume. That's pretty good with virtually no false positives. And as I've said before, scientifically, that's pretty good. No false positives. We like that. Um, at the Twit little world, we have uh, a couple of mail route users. Leo loves mail route, as does Tom Merritt. Both of them have been using MailRoute and have have come out and said that email accounts they thought they'd never use again have be, once again become usable thanks to MailRoute. There's nothing easier for mail filtering than MailRoute. You don't have to add any hardware or software. All you have to do is uh, sign up with MailRoute and then change your MX records. Do a little redirect so that your domain uh, starts your mail flowing through them and then mail route does all of the work for you here's what you got to do visit mailroute.info info to sign up and as a twit listener this is a very special account you will receive a 10 percent discount for the life of your account that's for as long as the account is 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 used as long as you have it 10 percent discount you have to go to mailroute.info so that's the website to use. Small business accounts start at $2 per month per user for 10 users. And because of demand for the Twit Army, MailRoute added a, a service for individual users as well that costs less than $30 per user per year for single users. Visit MailRoute.info and sign up with the email filtering service that Tom and Leo use. Now back to the show. Um, let's get talking a little bit about, we need to talk a little bit about um, humans and, uh, and, and where all these, all these different groups that we've been talking about stand. Um, so we've mentioned, you know, Ida, who turned out to be related to a lemur. We have Lucy, we have the hobbits. Um, there's um, another group. Uh, another story that was this week talking about, um, I, I believe, uh, ancient humans could have left Africa 100 mm. year, 100,000 years uh, earlier yeah. than previously believed. Um, you know, where does, what is the story right now? Um, how many different groups of humans, mm. kind of, uh, of hominid ancestors were there that died out? and then left us remaining. Yeah, well, um, the extinction of the hominins has been pretty much total. We're the only human species um, left when, you know, at any given time and, and over the past uh, six million years or so, there's been at least three or four different species living alongside one another um, at the same time. And, and human evolution within the past 10 years has gotten really bushy. It used to be viewed as sort of this linear march of uh, evolutionary progress where you start out with sort of like a gibbon-like or chimpanzee-like ancestor and you go to something like Lucy and you go to something like Homo habilis and Homo erectus and Neanderthals and then than humans, but it's really branched out um, since then. And, um, you know, everybody has, you know, each research group has their own sort of view about how all this fits together. Um, but really, there's a couple ma major groups. The earliest groups that you have around six million years ago or so, and, you know, you have things like um, Artipithecus, uh, Ramidus, uh, Arty, that came out in science a, a few years ago. That represents pretty close to the you know last common ancestor of, of human um, humans and chimpanzees. So you have this early radiation of this group called the Australopithecines, and um, you know these these are humans that you know, are shorter than us. They're they're a little bit more um, ape-like overall, but they're upright. They're, they're walking upright. They're bipedal, uh, and they have some of the telltale characteristics that you can use to identify them as as early humans. Um, Lucy and um, her species Australopithecus afarensis really represents the big 
branching point you're around like 3.4 million years ago or so you have um after that the the group that contains um the earliest members of our own genus like homo habilis and then on the other side you have uh, other australopithecines and what are called the robust australopithecines this genus called paranthropus like the nutcracker man these this uh group that still has you know this sort of ape-like face, you know, small, um, small forehead, big brow ridges, but have these really massive jaws and um, teeth that are living in uh, the eastern part of Africa and in South Africa. And then uh, moving forward, after, and, and they live until, um, you know, relatively um, recently. They're sort of our, you know, evolutionary neighbors. And um, during the past million years or so, you really only have, um, you know, our genus, you know, Homo, left and there are radiations that come out of that as well like you know neanderthals weren't our direct ancestors and i'll modify that in a second based upon all the new genetic stuff but there are there are sister mm -hmm. species that are living alongside of us and, and and some of the recent genetic um studies that they've been doing shows that there's been some interchange uh between neanderthals and um early humans so basically uh, non-african people have you know a certain amount of neanderthal genes within their um genomes uh so you know in, in a sense neanderthals count you know there's a neanderthal in your family tree somewhere uh even if they weren't you know necessarily like evolutionarily um ancestral to us but uh right. you know this is a very um you know rough overview but things have gotten very very bushy very very quickly and i think it's going to get even more complicated because one of the telltale uh characteristics that anthropologists have used to deter determine you know what the first human was has been bipedalism but what they're finding is that a lot of these um, early humans or candidates for the earliest humans all have bipedal characteristics you have you know artipithecus you have another group called uh, auroran uh, you have sahelanthropus which i mentioned before all of these you know really early forms seem to have been walking upright or have characteristics and their skeletons are consistent with that. So there might have been several types or several lineages of bipedal apes living at the same time, only one of which only one of which was ancestral to us. So the human fossil record is still relatively scrappy. I think there's a lot left to find. If I lost audio. I was I was confused for a second. Does that help? Oh, it came unplugged. That Yes, you're back. No, I, no it, it just lost itself for whatever reason. I unplugged it and plugged it back in. But, but, but to sum it up really, really, really quickly, um, yeah. you know, human evolution has gotten a lot bushier, and I think there's a lot left to, to, to find. Um, you know, most of the fossils that we have come from East Africa, from South Africa, a few from um, Chad and Western Africa. But you still have most of the continent left um, that's, you know, hasn't been uh, tapped for, for, for fossils. So I think within the next couple of decades, we're going to find a lot more early humans that are going to change up, um, you know, the story of what early human evolution was like. And thinking about what, uh, what species were in different locations uh, in, in Africa, in West Africa, the various locations where we found them, um, you're talking about, you know, six million years ago uh, through to say a hundred million years ago, a hundred thousand years, 50,000 years, you know, there's huge time scales going on mm -hmm. here. What kind of changes were happening in the environment as well? Do we know, um, did they, uh, we're 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 thinking that the the first uh, the the first human ancestors um, were possibly tree dwelling, right? Or maybe not uh, right. bipedal or upright. So they must have lived in really lush areas that had lots of vegetation. Right. Uh, it looks like the earliest humans that we know of lived in these sort of closed forested um, environments. And uh, what we know is consistent from, from their anatomy and from the paleoecology is consistent with that. And it seems that if they weren't already um, bipedal, they had um, adaptations to life in the trees that allowed them to walk upright when on the ground. This is something called an exaptation, where rather than sort of coming down onto the ground and knuckle walking like a chimpanzee does, they would um, stand up or have this odd sort of upright walk on the ground, which later got sort of co-opted into uh, upright walking. So walking upright as we do now might be a consequence of you know our ancestors' life in, in the trees, that their life in the trees was later co -opted some of the anatomy from that was co-opted to life on the ground. And um, there's a general, you know, there's climate fluctuations, but there's a general shift to, um, you know, a, a drier, more 
grassland type habitat. Things were opening up after the emergence of of humans. You know, there are oscillations and stuff during uh, at any given time period. But the world was changing in in terms of forest dying back uh, during a period called um, you know the Miocene, where you have um, you know the very beginnings of human evolution. Um, Forests. You, you had apes all over the world. You had you know apes in, in Europe, through Asia, Africa, uh, never in, in North America or South America, but through, throughout the old world, you had um, you know apes just about everywhere. But as the forest started to die back, these species start to disappear, and and the forests get replaced by the sort of grassland environment that al- allows these evolutionary radiations of like horses and elephants and other grazing mm-hmm. animals alongside us. So that's been the general trend. And then within you know the past um, you know million years. Or so you have you know the oscillations of the ice ages, um, you know, and right now we're in the interglacial um, period. Um, so you know we, we we just missed the you know us right now just missed the the glaciers and things that our, our ancestors and Neanderthals had to contend had with. Had to deal with. Uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think I, I I love the uh you know the that part of evolution how the um how the environment probably played a lot into the changes that very mm-hmm. likely happened. With, you know, as as species made way for species, and which ones actually ended up moving forward. Um, in terms of more recent human history, like is is it pretty much accepted? I mean, from what I've seen out of Africa, that's the accepted yes. theory. All the oldest species have been found in Africa. We haven't found um, anything older in Asia or any other part of right. the world. Right, right. This goes back to a debate that's been going on for really um, decades, if not you know, centuries. Um, out of Africa is is the best supported model right now. The thing that's changing is, was there a single dispersal? Were there multiple dispersal, dispersals? Right now, it looks like there are multiple um, dispersals of uh, early members of our own species out of Africa. It's just which you know dispersal was ancestral to you know our own lineage, which was the group that um, you know became established in Asia and started to move throughout the world. You know, using um, you know a combination of paleontology and archaeology and genetics, you can start to track these um, changes. The other model is called the multi-regionalism hypothesis. It used to believe that you have a species like Homo erectus, which we know was uh, you know, a world traveler. This is one of the first humans to leave Africa and disperse elsewhere through the world. That's why we find their fossils in China and Java, um, elsewhere th- throughout Asia. And the idea was that you'd have multiple spe- multiple pockets of Homo erectus all evolving in a Homo sapiens sort of in parallel of one another. And this was related to racism and some other, um, you know, I- ideas about, you know, my culture is distinct from yours, so we must have had a different, you know, sort of Homo erectus ancestor than yours did. That hasn't mm-hmm. held up, but, you know. Out of Africa is the best model for for um, human origins, and you know, the fossils and genetics and everything else support that. It's just a matter now of determining how many dispersals there were, and which dispersals uh, were sort of ancestral to uh, you know people as as we know them now. Yeah, and which groups of people? So which dispersals actually led to different groups of people, actually getting getting a foothold in different areas, right? Um. Well, that would be once they were out of Africa, like once that, you know, whatever dispersal it was, it was out of Africa and got established yeah. in, the, in the Middle East or Europe. You know, from there, how did, you know, populations, you know, grow and break off and, and, and travel elsewhere? Yeah. Okay. Um, other, other, uh, other, moving away from humans, the human centric discussion, mm-hmm. um, um, other other controversies that are ongoing. Triceratops is a big mm. discussion, and also the um, I forget they're the uh, like the dome-headed dinosaurs. But there's yeah. a big a big yeah. conversation in uh, in paleontology about um, the winnowing down of what were once thought to be these all these different species, but are now mm. being discovered or uh, I guess hypothesized to be different life stages. So young to to a, a sub adult to an adult species rather than three species now just one. Right, right, yeah, sort of a, a lumping of all these different species together, and and, and uh, it brings up a good point in that you, when you find a fossil. Um, you know, you need to think about what age stage was this? Was this a juvenile? Was this an adult? Was this a really old adult? Was this a baby? There are some um, fossils. I think one was called a Mosasaurus. It was supposed to be the smallest dinosaur. It was, you know, the, it translated to the mouse dinosaur. It just turned out to be a baby of something much 
bigger. So this is something that you have to take into account. And what um, you know, the debate surrounding Triceratops is, is whether uh, the dinosaur that we've called Taurosaurus was that the adult stage of Triceratops or not. The same thing with the other group of dome-headed dinosaurs, the Pachycephalosaurs, was this three-step um, you know, these the th three species that we thought were distinct, were they just life stages of the same animal or not? And uh, that's something that, you know, you, you can't just come out with one paper and say, okay, now it's, it's solved. This is an ongoing debate that paleontologists are having. And I, I think it's really a wonderful thing because we're starting to get in um, a more interdisciplinary science out of it because now you have to include, um, you know, bone histology. You have to consider the overall anatomy of the animal. You have to consider, uh, you know, the layering of these different fossils in, in the rock record. So you have to bring in all these different lines of evidence together to make your case, and it makes it a stronger science. We're getting a better idea of what these animals were like when they were alive, regardless of how it turns out, whether Taurosaurus is separate or not. It strengthens paleontology to have this kind of argument. And uh, there's just a paper out um, by a friend of mine, Andy Farkey, uh, in PLOS One, and he uh, described this really enigmatic skull of a horned dinosaur called Nedoceratops. You know, few people have ever heard of it. It's really represented by this one skull with a couple weird holes in it, and it doesn't have a nasal horn. And this was considered the intermediate stage between the Triceratops stage and the Taurosaurus stage. But Andy considers it to be its own distinct species and came up with a couple mm. characteristics that separates it. And in the bottom of that says he thinks he's found a juvenile Taurosaurus in the collections of a museum. So that's one of the significant parts of fossil hunting is not just going out into the field, but going back into collections <laughs> once you have these ideas and digging through and seeing, okay, well, maybe I did have a baby, you know, Taurosaurus around here somewhere. Um, so, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure how that's um, going to shake out. There's only been a couple papers and, and people are still actively debating it. But I think it's a great thing um, for paleontology to start creating this more interdisciplinary kind of, of science. Yeah, but I'm, I'm waiting for the, the introduction to the story. The intrepid paleontologist moved through the stacks of <laughs> shelves. <you know>? Yeah. <laughs> the dinosaur hunter <laughs> hunting for dinosaurs in the deep, dark, dusty basement. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it, it gives a whole new whole new perspective on dinosaur hunting. Um, we're coming towards the end of the show. I would love for you to tell everyone a little bit about your book. Oh, sure. Um, this is my first book. It's called Written in Stone. Uh, it came out through uh, Bellevue Literary Press this past November. And it's sort of a celebration of some of the major changes in the vertebrate fossil record. So I talk about the origin of the first uh, tetrapods, the first land-dwelling vertebrates, things like Tiktaalik and Acanthostega, um, the origin of humans, the origin of horses, elephants, birds, whales, sort of all these major transitions in the vertebrate uh, vertebrate fossil record that really sort of enchanted me from a young age. You know, I'm wanting to know where did whales come from, where did I come from, where did birds come from, you know, what, why are there feathered dinosaurs? And putting that in historical context and the you know, the debates that were going on around these fossils and how those have provided a richer context for us to understand the evolution of, of life on Earth. That's not the straight line march of this sort of simple, tiny ancestor to, you know, the modern, wonderful, complex animal. The evolution is bushy, it branches out, and there are a lot of fantastic animals that lived during the recent past that sort of provide the context for understanding the world as it came to be today. So it's like my little personal celebration of um, not only the history of life, but the history of science. That's great. That's really great. Can people find that? Is your book out now? Can people find it? Anywhere? Yes, yes. It, yes. Yeah, they should, whoever find books are sold, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes. yeah, yeah, it's out and available. Excellent. Um, so if anybody is interested in uh, taking a look at the, at the book, um, the book is titled written in stone evolution the fossil record and our place in nature and i just found it very easily in amazon amazon.com you can get it very easily if you're interested um did you have do you have a favorite dinosaur i'm guessing t-rex you know, oddly enough, it's it's the title of my blog, and I'll try and make this quick because I know we're running out, out of time, but uh, there's a dinosaur from New Jersey, a tyrannosaur from southern New Jersey um, that was originally named Laylapse, which is where I got uh, my blog name from, and uh, it was named by this guy named E.D. Cope, and he had this famous rivalry with O.C. Marsh, and uh, Marsh figured out 
that someone had used the name Lelaps already for a kind of mite. So under Cope's nose, in a footnote of another publication, he renamed the dinosaur Dryptosaurus. Well, I never really liked the name Dryptosaurus. It kind of sounds like Dryptosaurus. So yeah. I picked Lelaps for my, my blog name, but it's you know the Garden State's own tyrannosaur that we don't really know a whole lot about yet. Only one partial skeleton has ever been found and a couple other bits and pieces. So it sort of, to me, it sort of represents you know where, where I come from, the history of science, and one of my favorite dinosaur groups all in one package. Very nice, very nice. And and I know I'm going to draw this out just a little bit more with the T-Rex and we're talking mm -hmm. about the different size dinosaurs. Um, is there a mini or a nano T-Rex? Uh, yeah, there was during the 1980s, it was hypothesized that there was a, a little T-Rex called Nano Tyrannus. And uh, I think Bob Bakker was one of the main proponents of this idea that you had this tiny, like, you know, uh, dwarf version of T-Rex run running around at the same time. Turns out it's probably a juvenile of um, Tyrannosaurus rex. There's a great skeleton um, that they found a, a few years back in uh, the Burp. It's held in the Burpee Museum uh, in Indiana, but you can also see it at the Carnegie Museum in Pittsburgh uh, called Jane, and it's basically a teenage um, Tyrannosaurus. I think they just opened an exhibit at the Los Angeles um, Museum of Natural History as well with three different T-Rex um, life stages, and we can tell that they started off with sort of these sort of narrow, long skulls, and as they got older, their skulls got deeper and heavier, and their body proportions changed. So yeah, playing into what we were talking about before, you have these fossils that you know you might think are a distinct species, and it just turns out to be a growth stage of um, something else. And 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 uh, you know, Nano Tyrannus is one of those cases where you know you thought you had this little you know tiny tyrant, and it turns out to be just a, a teenage um, T Rex. I think Tiny Tyrant is going to be the name of my son, Nano, <laughs> <laughs> the Tiny Tyrant. Uh. <laughs> when he's finally, when he finally is, yeah. is running around. I'm going to, I, even though there's no official species anymore of the Nano Tyrannus, I'm going to have one. Yeah, have it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm convinced of well, this. They can, they can be trouble. The, the teenage ones bit each other on the face. That's one of the things I learned by looking at Jane. There's all these holes in her face that when they fought, they bit each other. Yeah, yeah. There's an illustration that looks almost exactly like that that was in the paper. <laughs> That's awesome. Brian, thank you so much for joining me today. This has been a lot of fun. You're just a wealth of, of interesting information. I'm going to call you all the time and be like, tell me about this one. Or maybe I'll just continue to read your blog. Maybe that'll work. Anytime. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. Everybody out there, if you are interested in finding out more information on um, all of our ancient relatives and more, uh, the paleontology and evolution of, of many ancient species. Be sure to visit wired.com, Wired Science Laylapse for his for Brian Sweetek's blog. And also you can find his writing at blogs, <clears throat> excuse me, blogs.smithsonianmag.com forward slash dinosaur. And uh, like I said before, check out his book as well, Written in Stone. It sounds like it would be an excellent celebration of science and so many species of animals that have lived on the face of the earth. I am Dr. Kiki and this has been Dr. Kiki's Science Hour. Next week we're going to be talking about science education and the media with Vikram Savkar. He's from Citable, which is a nature.com uh, endeavor. Until then, you can follow all of my sciencey pursuits online. I'm on Twitter at Dr. Kiki. That's it. Just D-R-K-I-K-I. -K -I -K -I. You can find me on Facebook. I've got a fan page as well. And you can subscribe to this show, Dr. Kiki's Science Hour, in iTunes. Or you can go to find past episodes of the show at our Twit website, twit.tv forward slash Kiki, K-I-K-I. -K -I. It's all really easy and we love your downloads. I love your downloads. So, you know, get online, get into your iTunes, subscribe, download Dr. Kiki's Science Hour. You know you love it. And uh, I will be back here next week, like I said, to talk more science with interesting people. Thanks for tuning in. And, you know, as always, if nothing else, I do hope that this one hour of programming made your life a whole lot more interesting. Until next time.